Welcome, 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 all you weirdos, to episode 143 of the pod. It's the Patio Slave podcast. It's the occasional crasher, Rob Riccatelli, joining in with the boys here, Tony, Tuan, sorry, Anthony, and Nate. For uh, <laughs> Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Sir Nathaniel. Uh, for an episode that, uh, that I 100% completely invited myself to. Sort of. We need you for this one. Well, I, I heard you guys talking about it with Spizzy a couple of weeks ago, and uh, and you talked about doing an, an episode of uh, of Woodstock '99. I was like, I'm in, I'm in, and yeah. then uh, and the then rest here we is are. History. We're back. Yeah, because I was there, and and somehow Nate was there. I don't know yeah. how that because he was like 11. Were you his chaperone? Something. Were you his chaperone? His I didn't even guardian. know him at the time. It it only makes sense that we were both there, but it almost doesn't make sense that he was there. No, because <laughs> Nate, what were you? 14, 15. I was young, very young. <laughs> when we were young, yeah. When you were young, but yeah, probably somewhere in that ballpark. When your parents hear this episode, this will be the first time that they've ever heard about you going to this. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, that's a good call, Twan. Yeah. If yeah. Nate's parents are listening, don't judge any of the the content of what's coming next year. We uh we love you guys, and and obviously it's all in jest. But yeah, they let you go at age what uh ten, and and Rob wasn't your chaperone. I want to kind of know because he, we, we all know Nate and Nate gets stuff done. He has been able to finagle his way backstage mm -hmm. hundreds of times. Before we get started, what did you say to your parents to have them say okay to this? I'm dying to know. <laughs> I mean, it's the most ironic plot twist because um, they pitched it to me. It was the other way around. Mm, what? No way. I swear. I swear to God. It was, yeah, I was late for curfew, I think three days consecutively, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Came back, this, this plot twist squared. I, my mom's like, so you're, you know, you're late for curfew again. I don't know what the deal is, but. Uh, you're going to Rome, New York, and you're going to think about what you just did. Yeah, right. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, it doesn't really add up, but it's, it's how it went down. Listen, my brother got you a little ticket. bastard. <laughs> You need a music festival, and let's give you yeah. the most fucked up music festival in the history of mankind to figure out what you did wrong. Because it was. <laughs> yep. I mean, I think it was a weird timing thing. I think maybe perhaps the ticket was purchased in advance, and the whole telling me that I was going to the festival happened to align with being late for curfew. So I, I wouldn't say it was a reward for bad behavior, but it was more or less, your brother's going to this festival with his friend and his father. And uh, I got you a ticket. That's what it was. His parents thought it was going to be just like Woodstock 69. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sunshines and rainbows and holding right. hands and yep. right. free water. and Dancing around in the mud, which was the same as Woodstock 99, but except you were swimming in piss and shit. It wasn't mud. <laughs> well, in 94, it was mud because it rained, right? Yeah. Right. And and that seemed to go off without a hitch for the most part comparatively, but 99 was an absolute shit show, literally a shit show. Like you guys were, yeah, in the nast the whole time. So it was crazy. Crazy your parents let you go, Nate, and crazy, and you weren't 10. You were, uh, you were a teenager, right? You were 15. Yep. And you were with your older brother who was what? At the time, probably 18? Yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah. And then his friend who was around the same age, and then their father who drove us to the festival and back. So. So I got one of those packages where I picked up a bus, I believe in Portland. Mm -hmm. And if I remember correctly, it was 225 bucks for the three-day pass and transportation oh, wow. to and from. So I hopped on a bus and I went with, uh, with my best friend, Keith. I mean, he was, uh, I think he's, yeah, he's two years younger than me. So I was 22. He was 20 at the time. And uh, obviously he was not going to the festival as a 20-year-old by right. any means. <laughs> But yeah, it was when this thing got announced and, and I had been obviously the four of us got connected because not only for our love of music, but our love of going to live concerts. And I've been to like maybe four or five before this. Oh, wow. Well, maybe maybe a few more than that. But I take that back, probably 10. But when I saw this lineup, I was like, I have to go to this. I have to. Uh, so I made it happen. And I. <laughs> It, it turned out to be anything that anybody expected it to be. Nate, do you remember the first day? Oh, yeah. I remember all of it vividly because I was so young. And watching the Netflix thing. I don't know if you did that, but that 
that was crazy in itself because it brought me right back there. And I remember it vividly too, but just, just seeing all that footage totally like totally brought me back there. And I don't know, it'll be interesting to see, to hear what you have to say. But when I was, when I was there enjoying the first day, cause the first day, well, I was going to say the first day was great, but there's been, wasn't completely great. And I'll get to that. But being around that many people, 225,000, I believe is what it was, being around that many people, and it was hot. Mm-hmm. Very and hot. I, don't re- I, I just wasn't expecting what I was getting into. And at first, it was like a huge, you know, it was a huge high because it was like, this is amazing. I'm seeing all the top bands that are out right now. In three days, this place is huge. There's people everywhere. And and when we got there, my my buddy was just like, you know, let's 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 go, let's get after it. And and we we took something, whatever, you know, you're at a festival. Right. I was a young, stupid kid. And uh we we set up in the yellow, do you remember the yellow? There was flagged areas for tents. Do you remember that, Nate? Yep. So you can remember where your tents were. So the yellow flag area, oh, we're in the we're in the yellow area. That's there's no problem. We set our tent up, we should be able to find that, no problem. Uh, well, the, the yellow flagged area was about a mile long. So wow. we set up our tent and then we like took off and, and went for a walk just to kind of look around and, you know, see some music from a half a mile away or whatever it was. And then me with, with my, cause I'm, I'm pretty good with this kind of stuff. Me with my, my good sense of like, we need to find our tent before it gets dark because Definitely. that's the one thing that we need to do. And, uh, we're starting to feel a certain way at this point. And uh, I'm like, I'm starting to get a little nervous here because we, we spent, I'm not even, not even exaggerating. I think two plus hours trying to find our tent and we weren't even like enjoy the music or the the shows. So we're walking around. I remember hearing lit playing in the background and I really, really wanted to see lit because I love lit and I've still never seen them to this day. Really? But but I, I was hearing them in the background and I was hearing all these different bands in the background, but I knew if I didn't find my tent first, I would be screwed. So I missed all these bands or whatever. And uh, we finally find our tent. And at this point I'm hot, I'm exhausted. I'm starting to feel a certain weird way. And I'm like, I need to chill out in my tent. I'm not digging this right now. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I, Damn. I think I spent like two hours in my tent and I'm like, this sucks. I want to <laughs> go have fun, but I can't be around all these people right now. Mm-hmm. I'm going to break something to you, Rob. It was only two minutes. You thought it was <laughs> yeah. two hours. <laughs> it probably was. And I, I remember hearing like George Clinton and Funkadelic playing. And I think it was, uh, I think I heard like, was it DMX maybe? Whatever band played right before Bush. I can't remember. James Brown. No, he played during the day. No, oh, really? Yeah. I can't remember. I should, I should know who it was. But anyway, I just remember being like, this sucks. And then I heard Bush start. And Bush started playing, and I was just like, I, I suddenly was like, holy shit, I feel good. And I, I need to go experience this. And I walked out, and, and just like, I remember walking on the, on the grass, and like, you know, because you're, Nate, you remember, you're like a mile back from the main stage. And there was still like plenty of room around and whatever. And I was just like, there was a breeze going, the temps had cooled down. And then boom, I was into, oh, by the way, my buddy had take, taken off like three hours before that. So <laughs> I'm, I'm by myself, by the way, no cell phones back then. So if you wanted to reconnect with whoever you were with, it was when you met back at the tent because you weren't finding them anywhere else. That's <laughs> nuts. Yeah. No. So that was day one. And I ended up loving Bush. They were so good. And I like, I was like, all right, cool. We're on now. Pulled you out of the funk a little bit. Yep. Gavin can do that to people. I mean, he's he's a talented individual. <laughs> he he was the one that got me out there. It was great. Yeah, I think they headlined night one, right? They yeah. did. Yep. Yeah. It wasn't corn. It wasn't corn night one. No, corn did play night one, I think. They yeah. played they played before Bush. They played before Bush. Which is odd. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You think about the Even tempo, then, yeah. the, the energy. Not not so much the the, you know the band's popularity it was more so the energy and i think i remember gavin saying in an interview he was like holy shit we're going on after corn yeah right (laughs) especially in that moment it's 99 and corn is like kind of starting to take over the world a little bit new metal is taking over the world so in that moment rob i would have been the same as you especially 
today I would have been like, cool, I'm gonna go watch corn. But in '99, I've been like, I'm I want to stay away from all these people. I'm hiding in my tent. <laughs> yeah, I need. Uh, the thing was is that my, my buddy who I was with, who I love to death, I actually just talked to him earlier tonight. He's just like, let's let's go. He doesn't give a shit about anything. And I was just like, I need to get used to this atmosphere because it was the most people I'd ever been around before. And it was, you know, it was, it was intense. It was, it was crazy. And then there was day two, which was hotter than day one. Day two was, was when like rage played and, and it was li- rage and it was limp biscuit and, uh, and Metallica, I believe was like the lineup for night two. And, um, I just remember it was, it was super hot that day and, and watching, I never saw Limp Biz. I was I was pretty far back for the whole Limp Biscuit craziness. But if you if you guys watch the the Netflix documentary, they talked about how the fact that you know when when Break Stuff came on, that's when that was the, that was the beginning of the end. <laughs> well, actually, I got a question about that. So we know how it unraveled, but like day one, did it feel organized? Did it feel like anything was weird? I mean, I had been I think up into this point, you know small little like old port fest like things like that like pretty small scale definitely not a music festival camping for that matter you know like we were talking about i was pretty young so i had never been to a music festival let alone something way in the middle of nowhere like rome new york's way out there you know so i didn't know what i was getting into and arriving first time first festival kind of an out-of-body experience like what am i even doing here (laughs) yes we all alluded to earlier i was in that same headspace like how is this happening why am i here I'm kind of a third wheel with my brother and his friend, but you know, whatever, I'm here. This is cool. I don't think it felt disorganized, but it definitely felt like, like it was hot as hell. Everything's like extremely industrial. There's just a bunch of trucks parked and like, you know, it's on an air force base. Right. So it's just like yep. concrete. So, you know, the visions I have of like a music festival are like everything I saw in like VHS tapes with, you know, rage against the machine, basically back in the day where it was like a proper music festival. So I wouldn't say that it didn't feel like a music festival on arrival, but it, it just seemed kind of rigidy, I guess, to answer your question on a, upon arrival, it seemed like it was like, is this, what is this? It seems like it's kind of thrown together on the outside. 100% agree with you. And like the first day, you know, I had my whole thing where I was just like hiding out my tent for a little bit, being a weirdo. Uh, but then, you know, then the second day was, was when the porta potty started overflowing and the lines to get anything were so long. And then I remember, you know, I, I brought some money with me, but I just remember just trying to stay hydrated and just to stay hydrated, bottles of water were $4. Do you remember that? I think there were more than that. I think there were eight from what I remember. Well, I think they just kept going up as the day went on, didn't they? Probably. I think that's accurate. But anyways, I I just remember that, you know, I I just started getting so dehydrated and I was so mad. I didn't really, because I was 22 and you were, you were 15. So looking back on it, I can see, I I think I would be, if I went today and this happened today, I'd be fucking pissed. Mm -hmm. But I was also like, that's a good point. I I was like in heaven. I was like, and I was like, well, maybe this is the way, this is the way this is shit's (laughs) supposed to go, you know, like. (laughs) You know, fend for yourself, all for one, one for all, you know, but I do remember at one point, I remember exactly what it was, but I was so frustrated that I, you know, couldn't drink, couldn't get water. And when I did, it was so expensive. And then there was day three and we can bounce back and forth, obviously. But then I just remember on day three, we were, it was the day that we got up close and it was during the day. I think this was day three when, uh, when Brian Setzer played and, and, He played, I think, right after Jewel or something like that. But that was the point when we were able to kind of get up close. And I remember day three was the hottest day. It was so fucking hot. And we were like fairly, we were probably like maybe 30 feet from the stage. And I just remember being so thirsty and so parched. But we didn't want to leave where we were because we weren't going to be able to get back. And there was these people walking around with with, uh, milk jugs, like gallon milk jugs filled with water from the from that little community, like mm-hmm. water fill up place or whatever, oh, selling yeah. them for 10 bucks. So Nate, I think the water bottles were four. We're, we're thinking, we're talking 1999 here. Four bucks is like yeah. 15 bucks now or 10 bucks or whatever. Cause they sold, they sold me a bottle of tap water for $10, which I gladly Ooh. took. 
And I remember drinking part of it and I remember pouring it on my face and it was so hot that the water burnt on my face Ugh. and, and like melted my skin and like caused like blisters almost like it's, <laughs> this is, it was that bad, but oh, we didn't want to lose God. where we were, you know, we, we right. wanted to stay where we were, you know? Are you sure that wasn't the the Fago from uh, Insane Clown Posse? <laughs> were they at Woodstock '99? Were they there? They were there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it might have been. I think it was water I was drinking. Uh, yeah, it may not have <laughs> but, been too. I yeah. mean, there are plenty of stories about that too. You said something that was interesting to me because, especially at that time frame, I mean, you're 22, Nate's 15. You haven't really been to something like this before. Come to find out, there's nothing like this. But at the time, you're thinking to yourself, this is just the way it is. I don't have any other experiences to like uh, go on to make right. me think that this might be, maybe we're being treated, we're being mistreated. Was it that way for like everybody? Did you get the feeling that everybody felt that way? Everybody was just, let's just make the most of this. Yeah, it sucks, but like, this is what it's going to be like. Yes and no. I mean, you got to remember, like you said, it was 99. Music festivals in the US, they didn't really exist. Like Lollapalooza was a touring festival that went to like regular sheds you know, for the most part. So this was kind of like a, the beginning of like replicating what they were doing in Europe. I think Coachella launched in 99. They skipped 2000 because of the aftermath of Woodstock 99. So like, I don't think the, the model had been really proven out yet. So I think everyone, promoter, fan, vendor was just like, this is kind of like the beginning of this thing. We're going to try to copy, you know, Rock and Rio and Brazil and all these festivals around the world that bring in big money and big sponsors and big bands like that had never been something that had really taken place at like a full blown, like festival in the middle of nowhere, camping style. I felt like, you know, for the most part, these were festivals that are traveling. So I think to answer your question, at least in my perspective, no one really felt like they were getting burned or it was a shit show, you know, beforehand proactively. Cause it was just like new, it was brand new. It was somewhat new, a new concept for, for this country. And I remember it's, it's funny. Cause I look back on it. And I watch, you know, the documentaries and whatnot. I remember, I don't remember like being really like super pissed while I was there, but looking back on it, I see what happened. It was yeah. very, very poorly organized. There was a, what, what did they say on the documentary? They, they had uh, subcontractors last minute have to come in and take care of all the trash and the porta potties. Yep. And there were lack of, there was a huge lack of staff. I do remember being like super annoyed that I couldn't get to a porta potty and without walking through piss and shit. And, but like, like I said earlier, if I went now, I would have been extremely pissed off. But at the time, I was just like, I do remember the last day after I uh, had my face melted. At that point, I, I do remember as much as, you know, we're all huge music nerds and we love live music and we love festivals. I do remember at one point, like in the afternoon, I was like, I want to go home. Oh, like, wow. this, yeah. cause I can't like, this isn't fun anymore because I can't, I'm, I feel like shit and I can't, you know, stay hydrated. It's hot. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm covered in dirt in my own <laughs> sweat and like whatever, you know, well, and other people's all that stuff too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So could you, cause in the documentary, the train wreck one, the one that's on Netflix, there's yeah. a clear, like. I feel like it was like late in day two or halfway through day two, there's a clear like tide shift where the, the, the staff mm -hmm. was like, I don't feel good about this. Like, could you feel that? Like shit's going to hit the fan. Like people are pissed. Like they, they at one point kind of gave up, I think not, not all of them, but I think they realized that there there's, there's way more, way more people than there are staff to control this. And they, definitely realized that people were getting really messed up and and you know rebelling against it and uh yeah. i think at, at, at a certain time they kind of realize and, and they say this in the documentary they're like we're screwed you know there's just i mean that's what mm -hmm. most of the documentary is about is that narrative you know right right exactly yeah in terms of like us or for myself getting that idea i think i was pretty clueless except for when the promoter or announcer was on the stage saying hey you guys got to back up or hey like we're gonna be a little bit delayed here for x y and z reason so it, you could start to see like things like gradually unravel unraveling in real time drink <laughs> <laughs> yeah between the announcements from the promoter and the stage chance to you know 
slow things down, take a few steps back, just small little warning signs. And it, yeah, like you said, about halfway through Saturday, it was like, it is starting to become somewhat consistent, which is kind of now more than ever, right? It's just like, oh, okay, this is the beginning of the end. Yeah. Well, watching the documentaries, you can definitely, I mean, there's a narrative that they're trying to put out there. They're trying to show that things start to deteriorate. Then they show things deteriorate and you see all these, you know, clips and videos, but like being there, it's there's no substitute for it being in the crowd and feeling people be angry and i'm sure as the the second day wore on and you get into that that limp biscuit set like people started to feel a little more angry and started to maybe not maybe not even angry maybe more emboldened cuz that's what happens with big crowds like that i feel like like oh everybody's just saying fuck it let's just do our own thing maybe that's break shit maybe that's you know swim around in what we think is mud maybe that's who knows what, but it ended up being pretty, pretty sketchy, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, people like to blame, you know, I, I think there was a lot of blame placed on Fred Durst in particular, but I, I agree with, uh, I forget who said it during the documentary is that, you know, yeah, was there a combination of him feeding his ego? Absolutely. But was he also trying to put on the best show for 225,000 people? Absolutely. Were they dehydrated? and pissed off because they couldn't go to the bathroom without crawling over feces. Yes, absolutely. So I think it all just kind of came to a head. And that was Nate, would you agree? That was like probably in the evening of, of day two is when is when shit really started to get in like crazy. Yeah. And in the bands itself, you know, no disrespect to the bands, but we're talking rage. We're talking Metallica. We're talking Limp Bizkit. You know, people are getting amped up. It's a perfect storm. Absolutely. Yeah, and you've got this this group of people that's already kind of getting towards this critical mass, and then you throw fan a fan on that flame, and that's exactly what yep. those that music can do. It's not necessarily the music that is making people do that. It's just the the fire is already there. Like this is just helping yep. make it make it go. Yep. And then add the you know the Woodstock banner as like a brand name, and everyone's like, oh, we got to live it up. This is a one time deal. Like let's. Let's make a show out of it, and there's cameras rolling. So I think everyone is Wait just a like one time deal. This is the third one. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in too. the last one, in the last one, <laughs> they knew it would the be the one. last. Yeah, right, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like that was when I think that was when my eyes opened. Like pieces of like the infrastructure were being used to like surf the crowd, and like I didn't see any fires, but I, I was about six feet away from uh, one of the towers that they were like rocking. And I was like, this is fucking sketchy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Jesus, because that's real life. You know, that's not like, oh, you're at a distance. Like I'm I was so really close to it, me, and my brother and our friend. And we ended up migrating. But at the time, I was like, is this fucking really happening right now? Like, I right. couldn't believe what I was seeing, you know, right. While watching these bands at the same time and kind of being blown away that I'm seeing you know, Metallica or Korn and Limp Bizkit, all these bands in their kind of heyday too. So, and I was, yeah, scrawny kid. So you gotta, you gotta imagine I was feeling in danger, but kind of running on adrenaline and being in that innocent kid at the same, all kind of intertwined, which is bizarre. Nate, I don't know how close you get, but another thing that I realized after the fact, when I had gotten home and watched all the MTV footage and, and whatnot, I didn't realize all the shit that was going on yeah. in the crowds, uh, the groping. And, you know, how, how crazy things were, because I'm, you know, you're, you, you have the screens and, and stuff, but it's, you, I didn't, I wasn't up in it. So I didn't realize how crazy it was until after I had gotten home. Yep. I echo that a hundred percent. When I got back, I was like, I kind of almost kind of like embarrassed. Like I, I was in that scene. I didn't, I had no idea that shit was going on. Right. I don't think, I don't, I don't think a lot of people knew. And I think though. Nope. Everyone saw the chaos and was kind of like watching the show. But I mean, I didn't know there was shit like that happening, which is really sad. And I, I remember getting chills when, uh, you know, you, you see the, the footage afterwards and there's like Kurt Loder. I, I, I can almost quote him. He's like, so we're we're packing up and we're leaving. Yeah, we're getting out yeah. of here. When you know when, when MTV leaves the biggest festival in the world early, you, you know, that's not good. Especially in that time frame. I mean, today they right. wouldn't even be there, but right. good point. Good point. <laughs> Back then they were there. They were front and center, and uh, yeah, right. It's it's in watching it. Obviously, in retrospect, twenty something years later, you see all that. You see the videos of of the the just the terrible way people acted 
like and that goes back to my point of people just feeling emboldened. It it's it's sick. It's just crazy. And, and you know, you you have assholes everywhere you go. Totally. Like, but there's a lot of there. There's two hundred and twenty five thousand people. So there's what you know, way more assholes than there normally would be. Right. Combined with the heat and all of the problems that you know came along with it, lack of staff and water and all that stuff, people just got people just had got to their breaking point and they broke stuff. Nobody, nobody gave them something to break either. They just <laughs> found their own things to break. <laughs> well, it's funny. We're, we're throwing out a quarter million people just like it's nothing. Like next time you're at like the TD garden, it's fucking 10 times that 12 Ten. times that. Yeah, so exactly. Like how, how I think to your point, like I can understand how you definitely unless you happen to be very close to it, you wouldn't know what was going on in the crowd. You would have no idea. It's so big. Right. But how close did you even get to the stage? Because think of the garden. Like, you're, if you're in the nosebleeds, you're far away. Dude, I was so close up during Jewel and Everlast. I was getting crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, you said 30 feet back. That's, that's like on the stage. It, it might have been more like, 40 or 50 but e even then it was like it was during the day it was the third day it was like it was not i was not up in that limp biscuit rage corn crowd you know yeah. i was not i was not up in that and i think i probably have a different I, I don't even know if i'd be the same person i am today if i was up in that i mean right. yeah. watching the footage whew. nate how close did you get so me my brother his friend his father kind of held back he mainly stayed for the most part, at the camping site, ironically, but um, cold down the fort. But I would, you know, try my best to stay close to my brother and his friend. But you know how it is in a crowd, like, especially if you're packed in there like sardines, like we were, like, you get separated. And it happened multiple times. And I was, you know, was always able to, to relocate my brother and kind of used him as like a, basically, that's where my eyes were, as, a, as like a beacon of like, all right, I got to like, that's my one responsibility is not lose and that's my brother. that's the thing. You have to, if you want to stay with somebody, you have to like, you can't lose them because that, I lost my buddy so many times mm -hmm. and because the crowd is so huge. If you turn your head to see something, there's a swarm of people. They're gone. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, you know, small little kid. So I wasn't really that tall either. So, but for whatever reason, I was able to cut like mainly because that was my focus. I was always like relatively close to them and they were enjoying it. You know, they were like moshing and doing the whole thing. I think there was a time can't remember what song. I want to say it was like Vietnam or something. But I was finally like, you know what? I want to have fun. I see my brother fucking like moshing in there. So I, <laughs> I turned around. And I said, hey, I want to go up. <laughs> so they put up, you know, their, their hands and, and they put me up to, to crowd surf. And they pushed me see all back the way. The tent. They pushed me all the way to the, uh, the barricade. And it was, it was like the most insane thing I've see ever you tomorrow. felt. <laughs> what, what band was that during? That was during Rage. Oh, wow. Okay, so oh, you, you got right up in that. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't mean to get up to, this, to the barricade, but they carried me all the way there, and I was just, like, pushed. And I think my brother said he saw me at one point and was super pissed because he thought I was going to get just brutally injured. Or <laughs> He's like, dude, you could have died. <laughs> and I'm like, fuck, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> but I saw everyone having a blast, and I was, like, this nervous kid the whole time, and I was finally just like, I want to do it too. But, yeah. That was my. That was the closest I got to the stage. This was the last time I got that close to the stage. And then I had. A, I remember having a disposable camera, and trying to get pictures while I was like on the crowd, and I, someone flicked it out of my hand. And I lost all those photos. Oh, oh man. Duh. duh. Yeah. <laughs> Dis man. Disposable camera days. No, no. Yeah, like you said, no camera phones. Nothing. Yeah. Right. Wrist, right. wrist strap for that. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if somebody ended up taking that and like developing it, because I. I mean, I remember finding one at uh, after prom at the party that we were at and it wasn't mine and i took a bunch of the like the rest of the pictures and then i had it developed just to see what was on there <laughs> i bet oh, yeah. if, if i had so, found that at woodstock like you never know what you're gonna see on that shit like you gotta you gotta you know, pick okay. it up and develop it right i mean you'd be able to smell those photos <laughs> <laughs> if somebody out there is listening to this and they were at woodstock 99 and there are a couple of photos of us out there and you recognize nate in those photos please yeah, send that please. to the body of the podcast i would pay for that for sure yeah i could see nate like walking around when like at the very end of woodstock like looking around for like concert ticket stubs and nerdery, and then he <laughs> he, fi he finds it he finds a 
disposable camera and he like his eyes light right up and he's it like is. oh i can't wait to see what's on this it's 30 feet from the stage <laughs> it has to be mine it has to be mine it's one of like 70 that are on the ground <laughs> yeah well it's funny you say that when nate stored his like nate's nerdery which is basically a tub full of his old crap uh concert <laughs> crap there was a small piece of plywood it said fred durst uh plywood no. yeah it did yep <laughs> <laughs> he took a piece of home so fun fact we'll, we have to mention this because we we've been we mentioned it before we started the show for those of you who don't know me i'm that the fourth wheel i worked in radio for years how i met the all these guys i worked for a station called wcy in portland maine alternative rock station and uh this is years after woodstock by the way but um I, uh, I, I tried to, I, I tried to get a special guest on tonight, but, uh, it, it didn't work out so well. And I thought he'd be the perfect guest too. Oh, he would have been. He would have been amazing. So I actually had him on my show. Uh, Nate will probably be able to help me out with the date here. Maybe you, Tony, actually, Tony, you probably would be cause you're like the Tony would know. Oh my God. With the dates with you. Yeah. Whenever black light burns came and played at the station. I'm thinking maybe 12, 2012. Yeah, 10, 11, 12, been... right in the, yeah, right in the chain, yeah, like into the second decade. Yep, yep. So I, I had Wes in on my show to the day of or whatever. Wes and, uh, Borland? Wes Borland, and uh, we had a great interview, and then towards the end, all of a sudden, he just casually drops an F-bomb. And, <laughs> and I'm like, and, and we're live. We had, by the way, we went on five-second delay the day after this interview. Oh, no shit. <laughs> because of this or just WCYY the time? <laughs> was on five second delay the day after this interview because of that. Yes. That's amazing. <laughs> and, and there's wow. me. I knew he did it. And of course me, you know, being in radio, what do you do? You ignore it. Right. And you yeah. pretend moving. that it didn't happen. Well, Wes did not do that. He kept apologizing. And I'm look, <laughs> looking at him across the way. I'm like, dude, like, I'm just like, just let it go. Just keep moving. <laughs> And he's like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm like, I'm sorry for shut. saying fuck. I'm just sorry for shut. saying fuck. Exactly. <laughs> over and over again. So afterwards, he just, he, he randomly, he's like, dude, take my phone number. If anything happens from this, like, please give me a call if I can help you out or whatever. And I was like, all right, cool. And I'm at, the, my, at the time, I'm like, holy shit, I have West Portland's phone number. Right yeah, now. right. This is, this is pretty cool. <laughs> and I didn't use it until two days ago. And uh, it didn't work out so well. But I know, I, yeah. I tried to I tried to surprise you guys, and I was like, I actually, I'm gonna read, read the oh, message. There's someone right in now. the Zoom waiting room. Hang on, no, no I'm just kidding. Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's West from Puddle of Mud. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, I texted the wrong West. Ah. <laughs> Everything was so blurry, you couldn't remember. It. <laughs> oh shit! Speaking of mud. <laughs> All right, that's that's what you come here for, people. Oh, shit. <laughs> well done, Twan. Well done. Uh, I just said, uh, I, I just said, hey, Wes, it's it's Rob, formerly of WCY in Portland, Maine. You said fuck on my show years ago when I had you on for a Black Light Burns interview. <laughs> Introduction. And then I told him about the whole Woodstock '99. You were there. Love to have you on. Nothing back. And of, <laughs> of course, of of course, me being the uh, the persistent person that i am here I, I gave him another text today and 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 still nothing back but hey we tried yeah so when much appreciated down the road you know th three weeks from now when he texts you back and he's like who the fuck is this <laughs> or no he's, he's gonna be like oh dude i'm so sorry i meant to respond did you guys already record it we can right. we can add yeah. an addendum we'll add an addendum in for you wes come on <laughs> yeah, come right. on the pod right exactly so who who was like let's talk music a little bit like who who had the best set do you remember? I mean, so I left early. The people I went with, the father had to be at work at, you know, obviously Monday morning. So we left. I think we dipped out on Sunday at like 4 p.m. or something. I remember like we were watching Creed and it was like, hey, we got to go. I'm like, oh, fuck, because I really wanted to see the Chili Peppers that night. So I saw, you know, part of Sunday, all of Saturday and part of Friday because we, we arrived late. I remember Bush was really freaking good. Like that, that Bush set was, was awesome. They were awesome. Killer. In fact, that was like one of my favorite sets. They covered REM's The One I Love, which was, yep. they ended up performing that many times in their concerts afterwards, but I had never, I, that was just, I'm a huge REM fan. So that was like, I was like, and I had just come out of my tent after like <laughs> yeah, right. three, three days or two hours or whatever it was, Juan. But I, <laughs> hearing, hearing them do that, I was like, holy crap, I'm back now. But Nate, so you, you didn't see the Chili Peppers. Yeah, I missed that. I missed the Chili Peppers and I missed the fires because of that. So I, we left 
I'd say probably an hour before the fire started, which is crazy. So as far as the fires, I remember being, you know, I was pretty, I was further up for the Chili Peppers than I was for any of the major night bands, I, I feel like. And I remember being with my buddy Keith and we, we looked over and we started seeing there, there was just one fire at first. And I didn't think anything of it. I was like, oh, maybe this is like, you know, there was so much shit going on there. Maybe there was like a little, you know, something that was supposed to happen. And then we start seeing multiple fires showing up in the distance. I'm like, well, this isn't right. <laughs> and uh, something's wrong. Yeah, something's wrong here. And again, as is, is is frustrated as I was, I still didn't understand at the time that people were doing all this stuff because I think they were just so fed up and dehydrated and just like out of their minds. And I didn't get that at the time. But looking back on it, it, it all makes sense. And I had no idea that I was in such a, you know, historic shitstorm mm -hmm. at the time, if that makes any sense. Oh, totally. Yep. Yeah. The turning point was Creed's with arms wide open. That's when, pe <laughs> that's when people started really. Marlin that's sore. When, <laughs> Twan, that's when people started looting. Yeah. I thought you were going to say it was when Flea just walked out and played his whole set fucking naked. <laughs> Butt ass naked. No pick needed. He, he used something else. Yeah. He came out in Creed set with a sock. <laughs> <laughs> with arms wide open. <laughs> oh, that's great. My name's Scott Stapp, and I got a fucked up jaw. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've made that joke on this pod before. <laughs> we have. Because Peanut gave it to him. Isn't that the rumor? Uh, yes, I think, I think that's the rumor. <laughs> but it's funny. Obviously, you have, I have huge respect for, for Michael Lang, obviously. Rest in peace. I mean, he, you know, he got the whole thing going or whatever. But it, it was interesting looking back, watching the Netflix thing. Uh, who's the other guy? I can't remember his name. The, the bald guy there. Yeah, I can he see He was him. like the main promoter there yeah. alongside. his name. Essentially accepted no responsibility for what had happened. And that, that kind of pissed me off a little bit because it's like, dude, you put on a huge, amazing or potentially amazing festival, but you fucked up and there was no, you know, acceptance of, of that. John Shear. Yes. That's who it was. That's who it was. So he's the, he's the Ja Rule of the Firefest fiesta. <laughs> <laughs> Walking scotch-free. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. How was the food? Because like Firefest, they show those photos like the bologna sandwiches. Did you guys have any food there, or does it bring I, your own? I don't. I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> you ate something though, because you're you're alive. Just so water, that, right? <laughs> right. The food for us, we we packed a cooler, and it was PB and J's all three days. Just PB and J, water, crackers. Yeah, that's what happens that's when it. you go with with your friend's parents or your friend's dad because <laughs> because they lunch. they actually think of this shit ahead of time, <laughs> right? Was it the combined jar of the the jelly and the pee pee? Oh, <laughs> uh, what is that called? <laughs> swirl. Uh, the swirl. Pee -pee was it swirl. Skippy or Jif? Was it, was it Uncrustables? No, it those was didn't Peter exist. Pan. <laughs> Peter Pan. <laughs> uh, oh, extra shit. crunchy. It needs to be extra crunchier. Fucking get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, obviously, I wouldn't take anything back. I'm, I'm. I love the fact that I was there, and Nate, I'm pretty sure you feel the same way, that you can talk about it and say that you were at that. But again, I know I keep saying it, but I don't think either one of us knew at the time that we were at not only Woodstock 99, but what turned out to be Woodstock 99. We had right. no idea we were at this show that would turn out to be considered potentially the, the failure it was in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think, and interestingly enough, especially looking back on, you know, we've gone to so many festivals since then that are like well-oiled machines, properly sponsored, security's intact, you yep. know, obviously years later. So, the, the, you know, like I said earlier, the model had been proven at that point or not, right? But you get to see like what went wrong and how can we rectify and how can we adjust to make sure that this shit never happens again? Because there, there was a big scare in the industry that music festivals weren't going to take place. And that's why Coachella skipped. Uh, the year 2000 and then came back in 01 because it was just such the aftermath was just so bad um, I'm, I'm sure it was likely hard to get sponsorships to even put on a festival let alone yeah around that time get talent to uh, commit to something that has just such a giant liability oh yeah for sure you said something that 
that piqued my interest, and it was a question that I kind of had for you guys. But watching the docs, they had that like kind of as Rob mentioned, subcontractor group of people doing a bunch of different things, and part of that was security. And you got those T-shirts, right? And people yes. were just selling them to selling them to concert goers. So for four hundred dollars. Oh, really? <laughs> Jesus. So some dude said he said in the interview he gave uh, he gave a shirt away for four hundred dollars, wow. and I guess the shirt got you backstage. Yeah, right. I feel like uh, I feel like this guy over here that was there. I feel like back in the day he he would have dug. <laughs> he would have. That dug, was my question. He would have dug <laughs> deep in that wallet to get that t shirt for four hundred dollars. No, I think he stole no, it out of somebody's fucking tent. <laughs> <laughs> So that's my question, Nate. Did you end up with what is this the the emergence of the Nate that we knew and loved from ages, you know, nineteen to you know, thirty ish, where you would just find a way into everything? I think I saw the uh yeah, the the ins and outs of what's possible for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Taking notes I, early. We were at uh real quick, uh not to not to switch festivals here, but we were at we were at Virgin Fest in in um in Baltimore. And uh, it was me and Nate with um, with two of our other friends. And uh, there was this free drinking lounge. I think it was a U.S. cellular tent or like a Verizon tent or or one of those phone tents or whatever. Singular. Singular. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Singular. Uh, and and we, we couldn't get in. And Nate's like, hold on. I got this. And And the kid literally like went down like on his stomach and rolled under this this gate. <laughs> Sounds to, about right. to, to get inside. And then I don't even remember. Maybe, maybe you can fill us in, Nate. I don't even remember what you said. He went up to somebody. And keep in mind, he's already the person that's in there. So he's obviously in there for a reason. He's allowed to be in there, <laughs> even though he snuck <laughs> under the gate. He somehow got us all in. <laughs> and now we're all now we're all drinking for free. And I think we hung out there for longer than we needed to because we were drinking for free. But uh, yeah. Yeah, do you do you remember what you said to get us in? <sighs> so Woodstock '99, I remember vividly. You know, wish I had the camera, but I remember pretty much everything from Woodstock '99. Other festivals, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair enough. I thought the punchline of this was like Nate entered Virgin Fest as a virgin, but didn't come out one. <laughs> <laughs> now that happened episode, to Petty. Episode one forty four. <laughs> that happened to Petty. <laughs> Nate, we have to do uh we'll have to do a uh a, a Lollapalooza episode sometime. Oh fuck that, yeah, dude! We that right there that. in itself. That that's uh that's Nate at his at his finest. <laughs> I always loved like rolling to a show with Nate and not knowing like you know not having tickets, but just having him be like, I like went to talk to this girl at we at a Weezer show in at Hampton Beach in New Hampshire, and we didn't have tickets yet. Sold out. Walk up to this girl who's ready to sell her tickets. I start talking with her and Nate. Literally grabs my shoulder and goes, "No, dude, I got this. We'll, we'll give you twenty bucks." <laughs> she just goes, "Okay, <laughs> two tickets for ten bucks a piece, and we're into Weezer." It was probably you know eighty dollars of the tickets, but she just wanted to get rid oh, of them. I was ready to pay her face value because I'm a nice guy, and it's like we're not fucking paying face value. No, nope. <laughs> get out of the way, bro. Nope. It's a scene out of a movie. He's like, he looks yeah. at you. I've got this, and he directs you back, yep. <laughs> and he walks over like he's the promoter. Exactly. I, I'm yeah, so good. I'm the radio DJ, by the way, that was actually had a couple interviews lined up at Lollapalooza. Legit interviews. I had no credentials, though, once we were out. You'd think that I'd be the one to somehow get us back in. Right. No, it was the guy that was not the radio DJ <laughs> that, that told me what to say to get us backstage. Ah, uh, man. It's all, you guys get the uh. picture? You get a picture of what it's like being friends with Nate? It's, it's fucking awesome. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. We uh, we hung out with CeeLo in the food tent. We met Perry Farrell. We met Jack White. <laughs> Guy from yep. Wolf Mother. Can't remember his name. Yep. Andrew from Wolf Mother. We got kicked out. And then, <laughs> and, and then the, as we were leaving, remember this? The, the, the lady that came over. And she goes, I saw he just kicked you out. She goes, I know you don't have credentials on. She goes, I'm back in, but just don't let him see you. <laughs> you you do remember that? that was Nate Grease that. Like, yeah, that, yeah. that was possible because of Nate. He'd, yeah. been, he'd been flirting with her for a half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> she was 70, but it didn't matter. Didn't matter. Yeah, didn't matter. If, if this goes south, let us back in. <laughs> These drunk boys seem really sweet. Let's let them back in here. <laughs> 
we were just hanging out drinking vodka and vitamin water you remember that yep and eating catfish oh yeah the free buffet the, the free, free buffet yeah <laughs> it, was, well, it, was the, it was the catering for the artists i think exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> and we were the only ones back there with no credentials whatsoever They're like perry this catfish is good but you couldn't have got <laughs> salmon bro like jesus <laughs> This wasn't on the rider. What? Yeah, where are my we, green M and M's? We met Perry Farrell. Never forget it. Nate and I quote this all the time. What did he say to us? Uh, what did he say? Can't remember. Uh, something like, "Oh, are you enjoying the festival? <laughs> are you enjoying yourselves at Lollapalooza?" <laughs> <laughs> How do you even respond? Uh, right. That's like the uh, the neighborhood dude from Family Guy, <laughs> the old guy, Herbert. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, God. Herbert the pervert. Oh, do, you guys, do you guys want to come back to my bus? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh shit! Well, that was a tangent, and uh, happy yeah. we got there. And yes, we will definitely have Rob back for uh, a little Lollapalooza and get that those stories in full. Nate, we did that three times. Yeah, yeah, three yep. years. Yep. Yeah, well, 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 that's a that's a separate episode in its own for sure. Yeah, but anyways, yeah, going back to Woodstock, I mean, <laughs> I think I think we I think we we pretty much we pretty much nailed it. And if anybody listening right now wants to kind of get you know a synopsis of the thing, uh, definitely watch the the train wreck uh, Netflix uh, three part series because that pretty much pretty much captures it. Nate, one last thing I'll say is Nate, you remember that vividly but can't remember anything else <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> hey long-term memory and short-term memory are things it's they true. are definitely things it's true i can remember shows dates openers i can't remember what i had for fucking lunch so it's so true it's so true i remember everything but that's just me yeah here no you do I... you are you are scary with that shit when sometimes. that goes away i'm not gonna know who i am anymore boys so right i don't want to be around me at that point <laughs> who are you <laughs> ah shit tom will bring up shit that i completely forgot about and that. bring it and bring it back into my subconscious and i would never ever think of it again if it wasn't for him little minor details too i mean it's it's not a bad thing right no it's oh, amazing it's, it's awesome. amazing yeah it's a phone a friend on who wants to be a millionaire? Like, <laughs> yeah, you're you're number one, dude. <laughs> Nerdery no. phone a friend. Yeah, and tone tone just asks himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, hey, I'm gonna call myself. Hey, uh, I I just want a million dollars. I just called my answering machine. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, final thoughts from you guys, Nate. What are, what are your final thoughts about Woodstock '99? Lay them on us. For, for me, I mean, being so young, um, so I was a huge music fan. In fact, to answer your question, super long form, Tuan, I mean, there was a lot of good sets, but Rage, for me, I, we were obsessed with Rage Against the Machine in 1999, right? So it was like seeing my favorite band at the time live, life-changing. Seeing that band is life-changing. Seeing this festival is life-changing. Being that age and seeing all this happen, for me, it was like a coming-of-age type situation where I was like, wow, like... This is what the real world's like, you know, chaos, uncontrolled chaos. But there's also a lot of beauty in that, too, if you look, look past it. And obviously, the music is, is art in its own right. But I think I walked away learning a lot about, you know, <laughs> humans, life, and um, how you get through it. Because we got through it. We got out of there unscathed. Trust your instinct and uh, never give up. But also be aware of your surroundings because... Uh, I, I would have never had thought that I'd be in such a dangerous um, environment going into it. And now looking back, you know, that was a unique experience. And uh, I would do it again. And I wish I had a, a journal or I wish I had that disposable camera to, to relive some, some additional memories. But man, it was, it was cool to be there, man. 100%. Well, one thing I remember, because that was when, what time of year was it? The summer? I think yeah, it was July. July. I think it was, it was right after my 22nd birthday. I think it was like July 23rd. So Nate came back just wearing a sock. <laughs> he, was, he was so inspired by Flea. Where, where was the sock? <laughs> On his ear. <laughs> On his oh. ear. All right, gotcha. <laughs> Rolled the whole way home. It was hot. <laughs> he lost all his clothes and the digital and, and the and the disposable <laughs> camera. Yeah. <laughs> that dad was like, never again. <laughs> all right, Rob. Final thoughts, man. Uh so 
Nate, Nate kind of nailed it for me too, as far as it, it was a huge coming of age thing. I mean, granted I was five years older than him, but I was still 22. I mean, like I'm, I'm still a kid, essentially my brain hasn't fully developed and I was, you know, it was, it was a huge, amazing experience seeing all of these bands. And, and one thing that I feel like we didn't talk about for me, one of the highlights other than, you know, Bush was great too. And, and all the, in all these second stage bands too, like collective soul, that was super fun. And mm-hmm. like the daytime bands, I had so much fun during the daytime bands too, but Metallica was, was super fun for me. That was such a great show. And I also wasn't super far up for that, but I had so much fun at that watching Metallica, you know, one and only time I've ever seen him actually, sadly, wow. but um, it was, yeah, like you said, Nate, it was a coming of age thing. I'm so you know, thankful that I was able to be a part of that and, uh, and, and able to live through it and tell the stories. And I actually do have pictures, so I'll share them with you. Oh, Ooh, nice. All right. They're, uh, they're, you can imagine how great quality they are also from a disposable <laughs> camera. So, <laughs> so the one, my last question for the both of you is seven dust was what Saturday. Seven dust. I remember played during the day. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And we've we've had Lejean on this on on this podcast back in the summer uh, around the Tattoo of the Earth stuff. But there's a a clip of him yelling, "Look at the fucking rainbow, y'all!" Look at that fucking rainbow, y'all! Everyone, look at the rainbow! Look at the rainbow! Look at the rainbow! Look at the rainbow! Do you remember him doing that? No recollection. Uh, <laughs> Tony, are you expecting that I would remember no, that? Is that no, no, you're right. Good point, Rob. Good point. Who's in the tent? <laughs> <laughs> I saw the rainbow in the tent. I saw my own rainbow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A couple double rainbows. rainbows. <laughs> double rainbow. Whoa, double it, rainbow. It was, it was a double rainbow. I don't recall him saying that, but I remember seeing their set, and I remember being stoked to see them in the fall in Maine at the State Theater. I think it was like November of the same year. Wow, did you guys see that rainbow? Here's a song called Bitch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It was like in the middle of a song. I'll send you guys the clip in the group text, but uh, and I'll probably have played it in this episode. But go go look at it online. It's a fucking um, it's an amazing clip. I look forward to it. All right, Rob. Thank you for joining us once again to talk Woodstock '99 with us. And man, I'm I'm excited. I always love having you on because we could do this. We would do this without the microphones, without recording. Like this is just what we do yeah. when we hang this out. This is so. essentially what we do when we hang out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. Bears at the bar, right? So uh, super stoked to have you back, and, and we will definitely do it again. No, I appreciate it. Always uh, appreciate you guys having me on, and uh, and thank you. Yep, the Lollapalooza episode, and the Virgin oh. Fest episode, and the. <laughs> fucking nativa episode and oh my god we have so many i was at the nativa episode i could i could talk to that one <laughs> that was a oh good my time. god <laughs> most of those stories don't involve any of the bands <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> true true the one thing the one story i remember the best about that and i will leave you with this is me and nick sitting on my car at i don't know one in the morning after the flaming lips and people walking by and it's july and we're yelling don't slip on the ice and people kept looking Every single one of them. (laughs) Every single one of them. Yep. (laughs) Oh, shit. Thank you, Rob, for coming back, man. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, man. Thanks, Rob. Thank you for listening to Patio Slave. We are at Patio Slave on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all of the places that you can find us on social media. Facebook, Patio Slave Podcast. YouTube, Patio Slave Podcast there. Email us at patioslavepodcast at gmail.com. And hey, if you want to become a supporter, click on the link at the bottom of the episode and give us a dollar, give us five bucks. It keeps the lights on, keeps us going. We really appreciate that stuff. Thank you. Did Tony tell you uh, what I was... No, uh... I didn't. I saved it. I mean, you want that was for you because that's that was your thing. I'm so I'm still super bummed. I was watching the um the Woodstock next Netflix thing, and um I finished two out of the three, and I just got this idea while I was watching it, and I was like, why don't I reach out to this person that I actually have their cell phone number, mm. and um hold on. I'm going to send it to you guys right now. I actually have their cell phone number because, and Nate, you might pick this right up. They said fuck live on my radio show during an interview back in 2012. And he felt so bad about it. And he gave me his phone number and he goes, if anything ever comes of this, please call me. I feel bad. And I've had his number this whole time. (laughs) So I decided to reach out to him 
but sadly, I never got a response. And I just sent it to you guys. <laughs> nice. We've talked about BLB on the, on the podcast. I've brought them up. Who's BLB? Blacklight Burns. Oh, oh West Borland? West Borland, dude. <laughs> I tried to get West Borland on the show tonight. Uh, uh, that would have been fucking and great. I sent him a I sent him a follow up today too. I was like, dude, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be annoying, but ten or fifteen minutes. Man, imagine that. 